You're listening to Exposure on Radio X. I'm John Kennedy, and that is Vampire Weekend with Ice Cream Piano. It's the opening track to the brand new album, Only God Was Above Us, which has just come out. And I'm very pleased to say that Ezra Koenig from Vampire Weekend is here with me in the studio. Hello, how are you? I'm good. Hello. It's, it's great to see you. Um, thanks for coming in and, and doing this. It's, uh, it's almost a tradition. We've done it yes. a few times now. Um, so Ice Cream Piano is an amazing opening track because it starts all slow and mm-hmm. then it goes off to a canter and then it gallops and then it goes back to a canter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot goes on. What's going yeah. on? Well, as you can probably tell, that, that, that song was kind of stitched together. A couple of different ideas that I started to realize seem to belong together. That there's Yeah, that the A section and the B section, and then the fact that the tempo jumps up. I thought, this is perfect. It's one of those ones where you just always know it's going to be track one. Um, and I think it kind of t- sets the tone for the record. Um, you know, it opens with uh, some profanity, mm. which, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, that's like a interesting way to open the record. But but really what's, uh, you know, what's happening in that beginning is, is some sort of dialogue, and um, I felt like this this kind of back and forth between um, uh, kind of like cynicism and optimism that that you kind of feel in that opening dialogue it has a lot to do with the whole record. So yeah, it felt good, and and actually that's when we started here in London, um, and uh, I was living here with my family for six months, and Ariel Rexheid, our producer, came over and was really beautiful couple months of, of us working together and we'd uh, worked at a small studio and uh, made a veil and I remember when we first made this demo and then uh, we went we we went with a bunch of our American friends to Paris for Thanksgiving um, and I just remember being on like the Eurostar and listening to it over and over and over again and be like okay I'm, I'm very excited about this and I was never even though people occasionally suggested other stuff for track one this is I, I'm very open to feedback for sequencing, and, and the other guys bring a lot to the table there, but I was just like, I can't budge on this one. Yeah, that's interesting. And what is an ice cream piano? Is that the color, or is it a particular sound? It's, um, the in the chorus I'm saying, in dreams, I scream piano, like the uh, the musical term. Um, so for anybody who, who never studied music, you know, on like a, the sheet music... It, they write the uh, uh, how loud you're supposed to play. So forte and fortissimo are very loud. Piano is quiet. Um, so this it was kind of imagining. You know, obviously when in your singer and you get to the high notes, especially if you're not a trained singer and you don't have a lot of control, you got to put be as loud as you possibly can to try to reach there. You got to belt. So this I, I like this idea in dreams. I scream piano. The the contradictory nature of knowing how to. Uh, have scream in a quiet way um and then when i wrote it out i was like it looks better as ice cream <laughs> ice cream piano <laughs> yeah it's weirder yeah. excellent um and you say you recorded that song or started that song in london and i understand that the album was recorded kind of all over the world pretty yeah much. so why was that it's it it gives it this kind of like glamorous international vibe when you look at all the the cities london new york la tokyo it's a little bit more mundane. It's just that my my wife had different jobs in places, and you know, so we moved the family, which was great and fun, um, and and also provided a lot of downtime. So I wasn't obsessed with the album all the time. But while you know, if I'm in London for six months, of course I'm going to see if Ariel wants to come work for some of that time, or if I'm in Tokyo for six months, I hoped he would come. So uh, yeah, even though it had this real international feel, you know, in in some ways, wherever we were, it was just back to our semi-amateur feel of just, uh, you know, a couple guys in front of a computer, just, uh, you know, talking about life. Yeah, yeah, because there's an interesting aspect to the whole record where a lot of it sounds quite raw in places. Mm-hmm. A lot of the way it's recorded sounds raw and it sounds like a band in a room. But then on top of that, there are strings, there are choirs <laughs> yeah. and, and all sorts of other sounds. Well, it takes a lot of work to make it sound that raw. And <laughs> Ariel is truly the, the master of it. He's obsessive. There's times where he would have, um, he had CT come in on one song, I think it was classical. And he said, all right, just start playing. He's like, what, what do you mean? And he's like, just play, just play the main drum part without a click track, <clears throat> without any kind of guide track, 
because he just wanted to see what speed he played it at. And and the truth is, you know, back in the day, of course, it's a natural tendency of humans to be raw. So if you were trying to produce something slick in the 70s or 80s, you would need world-class musicians, world-class producer, um, and that would be the hardest thing in the world to do, you know, is to, you know, make the thriller or something. You need the, the best of the best. Whereas today, the default mode of music production is loops on a grid. So to make something that has a little bit of a, a natural uh, sway and movement and and the tiniest speed up, the tiniest slowdown like you might get in, 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 a, in a live performance, that actually takes more work. It, it's much easier to make something slick now and to find that the middle ground takes forever. And so we're always re-recording drums and trying to move this and that. And, and thankfully, I'd probably give up sooner. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, Ariel is always kind of so monomaniacal about it because he'll always stop and be like, this this sounds a little bit too dead. and Or I'll be like, it doesn't, doesn't is that part of like a tiny bit messy? And we'll find that perfect middle ground where we leave the, the life in. Yeah. But it takes forever. Yeah, that's really interesting because it, it, there's so much to listen to on the record that each time you listen, there's another little thing that mm. you pick up on. And, and yet at the same time, it sounds relaxed um, and like you're with a band in a room as they, as they play these songs to you almost, you know, which is quite interesting. And classical, you mentioned, that is the next song. Right. It kind of starts with this strumming guitar. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be you in the corner. Yeah. Um, but then there's so much more going on. Right. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's two different drum sets kind of going at the same time. There's saxophone. And yeah, it's it, it's with Vampire Weekend, it's rarely a band in, in a room. We've always been too much. I mean, you know, we do that live, but it, it, we, we've always been such a think of the albums as recording projects first and foremost. And, you know, we'll sort it out later when, when it's time to, to play it live. But I think within that, we still try to keep our kind of messy human performances and 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 there you know sometimes that involves kind of time stretching them or you know playing something in an easier key and then moving it and that and that gives it sometimes an even stranger quality but uh that also gives it a slightly it can give it like a sampled feel almost like we're sampling ourselves um and that was an important texture i think this album needed there's there's actually not a lot of samples on on this album, but there still is that that feeling of taking bits of live material and uh, reorienting it together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting uh, because they like classical has these lovely piano chords, mm-hmm. and and the way piano is used across the album. Sometimes you think, well, well, is that looped or is that somebody playing through the whole song? Or and it's it's just fascinating to listen to. And then with with classical, when that sax comes in, mm-hmm. um, that's like whoa. <laughs> yeah. So what, what's the song about? Well, I yeah, I wonder where I wonder what the first lyric was. It was probably yeah, it was probably the hook. The um uh I know walls fall, shacks shake, bridges burn and bodies break. It's clear that something's going to change and when it does, which classical remains. Which yeah, I guess as I think about it now, what does that mean? I guess it's a little bit of like the, you know, the 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 victors right history. So there's always the idea of what's classical, what what's understood as being um, uh, consensus history, reality, consensus values, classical values, that always changes, and it's there, there's always a a fight between different factions, and um, and of course everybody knows this. You you go back through history and you think that everybody always believed this, and it's like no, that that time won out, and depending on where where you sit. Sometimes the the good way of thinking went out. Sometimes the the bad way of thinking went out. So, especially in an album that's, uh, I think, has a lot of layers and a lot of references to memory and the layers of history. There was something kind of cool about looking backwards, not saying well, which which political idea is winning out in the future. It's almost looking backwards. Which uh, political ideas of the past, which ph- philosophical ideas or spiritual ideas of the past will win in the present and rewrite history. I'm getting a little bit back to the future with my timeline. <laughs> Forgive me. It's very interesting, though. Um, so what can you tell us about Capricorn? I mean, this is a slower mm-hmm. track, and you slow things down with these lovely, loose, open-sounding mm-hmm. drums. Sounds great. Thank you. Well, this is a song that 
we, it was an early one. You know, if I played you the demo from when would this have been three and a half years ago or something, you would see all the the components that that go into the final product. Of course, there, it still took a lot of work to get it there, but um, kind of came together over at Ariel's house and. Yeah, it, it naturally started with acoustic guitar and piano and kind of slow and pretty. But I, I knew that, I don't know, I wanted this album to have a a hardness or a toughness or a heaviness. I'm not sure what the best word to describe it is. So, I, you know, you can imagine if you only heard the first verse and chorus, you might, it's a kind of like a tasteful 70s type song. And I remember saying, I was like, I just have this feeling that like it could get like big. And I don't think it really end, ended up sounding like shoegaze, but, you know, almost like a, like a you know. Yeah. So he was like, all right, let's get out the whammy pedal. And uh, through this kind of like really in, these intense guitar moments and the um, and the synth that we kind of played together, I was going while he's kind of like twisting the knobs. We we felt like, OK, that's like a it's it's a big leap. And yet it felt appropriate once you get to that that, that second chorus like it. uh and something about that dichotomy um, of, you know, sweet strings, piano, acoustic guitar, and then whammy electric guitar, intense synths, that felt right. And it kind of opened up a pathway for this album um, because, you know, I, I listen to all types of music and and I'm always looking for ways on each album to explore a, a tone that has never been a part of Vampire Weekend. But I'm very cognizant of the fact, too, that it needs to sound like Vampire Weekend. So the idea of saying, like, things like heaviness or, you know, big big guitars, that's very much not what we started as. And when we started, there was not a distortion pedal in sight. I was obsessed that I wanted my guitar to sound clean and simple, and that's what I was into at the time. You know, and I, of course, I still liked a lot of the classics of distorted music, but it, there was no way to integrate it. Whereas now it's kind of thinking, how can we still sound like Vampire Weekend? So once, once we had this, it was a good proof of concept that uh, a an element which had barely been a part of our music could sit comfortably in our world. So yeah. it was an important song yeah. in that sense. Yeah, it's really interesting. It is, yeah, it's very integrated. And the, and the way the strings work, it's, it's there's a great contrast between the, the two areas that you're bringing together there and capricorn is it a star sign reference is it what it, it is a star sign reference and, and i'm lucky that a lot of things rhyme with capricorn because <laughs> i just remember thinking um you know i've always been been interested in that that feeling um that yeah you know, i don't know for me maybe because i'm from new jersey i associate with tony soprano that feeling a lot of people have i didn't get in on the ground floor i missed I missed the opportunity. Other people got while the getting was good. I got in some weird halfway, lost generation type thing, and so I, so I remember kind of writing a thing like, and I don't I don't know that much about astrology, so I was thinking, well yeah, what's the I was like, what what sign is born at the end of the year? Because I was thinking about somebody whose birthday is like December thirtieth, and it's like, oh, what year were you born? It's like, I, well, I was born nineteen eighty seven, but then you know, for a day. So I was thinking about that concept. You're born born the year that you were born because people really care about the year they were born people put it on their license plates people use it in their uh reddit names <laughs> i don't know people like <laughs> yeah. you know or whatever get tattoos so i was thinking about well yeah what if you're the person who was born in a year but you got three days of it and there's something about that that felt like that kind of not getting it on the ground floor so anyway i got if it had been sagittarius i don't know what i would have done but capricorn the year that you were born <laughs> finished fast and the next one wasn't yours and i was like whew okay good thank you capricorn <laughs> i love that sometimes it you know simple things are important mm -hmm. in in how you create you absolutely know, that makes things work really well only god was only god was above us is the title um yeah. where does that come from and i think it links into the artwork doesn't it yes and and, and on this album we were very lucky to find the image, well, the images that would comprise the album artwork pretty early in the process, which is not always the case. And there are these incredible pictures taken by Steven Siegel, um, who was a young photographer um, in the 80s in New York. Um, and he 
went to uh, what he described as a subway graveyard in New Jersey. So as soon as I read that, I, I loved everything about that. A subway graveyard in New Jersey really spoke to me. And and these, uh, you know, kind of messed up 80s uh, New York subway cars that are bashed up, covered in graffiti, were overturned. So, you know, just picture a, a subway car, but it's 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 on its side. So he and his friends could use make these incredibly surreal images with a pretty simple technique, which is like uh, just turning the camera. So suddenly, you know, this guy appears to be sitting, but then how is that guy standing uh, on the wall? You know, so they're kind of, there's no editing to them. They're just really simple pictures uh, of uh, using the, the, the kind of just like simple physics of an overturned subway car. So I was so struck by them because I loved the look of them. I loved the how surreal they were. And, and I got stuck on one in particular. I said, uh, this is the album cover. And it's such a beautiful image that eventually I realized, I don't want to mess this up, throwing a big old Vampire Weekend or a title on it. And the only text that you can see in the image is a newspaper this guy's holding, which, which I imagine Stephen probably chose purposefully, which was from uh, 1988 New York Daily News, and the headline was Only God Was Above Us. So I said... All right, we'll call it "Only God Was Above Us," and that was early in the process. And I, I, I thought, I thought, you know, at first I just thought, yeah, that, that's a, that's a fine name. And then, you know, as the years go by, I started to think, no, 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 this is this is meant to be. This is the only name. And then eventually, I, I, I paused and I said, why did the newspaper say "Only God Was Above Us"? I it didn't even, you know, whatever. I'm thinking about a million other things. What a strange headline. And then I finally looked it up, and it was about a a, a flight to Hawaii where the roof ripped off. And the newspaper interviewed um, a guy who'd been on the flight, and they basically, you know, basically said, "What was that like? I mean, imagine what a harrowing experience." And he was like, "It was crazy. He looked up, only God was above us." I was like, "Okay, that's where it comes from." Yeah, it's great. I mean, it, it's it's fascinating to hear the resonances and how you know that all links together. Yeah. You no, know? and yet yeah, the, the the very title does conjure up a whole load of other thoughts as well. Sure. And it's interesting that you know you saw the image and it linked in to the album very pretty early on yeah you no know, and that stayed with you and and it became important as a, as a reference point i suppose totally and you know i i always like having little folders of words and phrases and images because it's so useful f- a for for you know myself if i'm just trying to write a song and take a look at some pictures that i kind of put together or, or some phrases you never know where that comes and also for showing our collaborators too because the uh i felt especially with that image and i often describe that image as being um pink floyd meets the beastie boys and you know that's whether or not you think our album sounds like that that's a um a provocative uh, gauntlet to throw down to your collaborators. Look at this. Does this look like if Pink Floyd uh, moved to New York in the mid '80s and they brought the Hypnosis team to make the album? And, like, yeah, imagine that if like Pink Floyd made a Some Girls, like hanging out in, like <laughs> funky New York. What would that be like? And again, whether or not it sounds like that, these these strange ideas get people's minds going. You know? Yeah, yeah, totally. That sounds great. Connect is the next song, um, and this is interesting because at one point it just stops. Mm. And there's quite a long pause. Yeah. Um, and and then it carries on. Mm. So it, what? What? You mean like thinking? when the drums stop? Yeah. yeah there's yeah. a there's a moment. It's like a big pause. It's because it gets pretty pr- frenetic. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly it just stops. And it's like, oh, is that the end? No, right. no, no. Yeah. It's it's kind of interesting the way that you've done that because that, it's almost like that. It's not just a stop and start. It's kind of mm-hmm. a, a moment for reflection in that you know, two yeah. seconds or something. I mean, in a in a weird way, this this song is a bit like Prague. But, you know, Prague to me is so often associated with uh, either uh, virtuosic guitar playing or maybe cool, weird uh, keyboard sounds. N- not so much just piano, but this is just, you know, kind of plain Jane piano. Maybe not that plain, weird, weird sounding piano with, with all these different sections. And, um, yeah, this one we kind of really like stitched together and we wanted it to feel a bit like a have, be, feel like a bit of a journey. Yeah, yeah, it certainly is. Um, and and what kind of a journey are you taking us on? I mean, you mentioned the Book of Revelations. Mm. Um, you know, is is this a, a cerebral journey? Well, there's there's also a, a a line in the song about the guy who says, "Before you lost your spark, took acid in the park while living in a basement." And I was also thinking about 
I've, I've, I've described this song a bit as being psychedelic Gershwin, and I've had some interesting conversations with people as I've started to play them the album. On the one hand, when you think of... Uh, it maybe you know th- this might be a um, a paradox, but if you think about psychedelic places, you might because of you know s- uh, seventy years of psychedelic culture, the English countryside. We associate the pastoral English uh, vibe with with the psychedelic because there's been great work that kind of combined those things. Of course, you'd probably think of uh, India, you know, and the the Indian influence in Western music. The a place that people don't think of as being particularly psychedelic is uh, New York City, and yet many psychedelic experiences have ha- been have happened there. Maybe more than anywhere in America because it's our biggest city. And you know, you start to t- talk to people, and some I've met so many people. So you know, the first time I took a lot of acid or mushrooms was in um, Central Park, and you think like, right, because that makes sense, and you, people. They, I'm sure they saw Beyond the Veil, and they probably had some strange experiences of being in um, surrounded by trees and then, you know, making it to Fifth Avenue or Central Park West and kind of uh, seeing this in- insane cross-section of humanity. So um, I always thought there was something interesting about uh, combining the, uh, the very uh, down-to-earth, uh, you know, no-nonsense side of, of New York uh, with... The kind of uh, spiritual psychedelic side. So I, I think there's a little bit of that dichotomy in this music. And then also you think about what yeah, what is psychedelic music? Like, it it we have a certain uh, it's become a genre. So it it's a it's a set of references. Um, but of course, it, you're trying to describe the indescribable, and you could think of well, yeah, what about in yeah, is Gershwin that far away? You know, from from these kind of. Uh, strange forms of spiritual music and obviously jazz and you know whatever it could go on and on yeah but yeah yeah that's really fascinating and does that link into connect and the title because is this about trying to connect you know, because in, in many ways you know a psychedelic experience is about connecting or trying oh, to yeah, reach yeah. out and- absolutely yeah and i was kind of thinking about the uh yeah whoever this uh character is in the song the person who maybe used to take acid in the park but the whatever they're at a later phase of their life and they're saying is it strange i can't connect it isn't strange but i could check and basically ultimately they're saying the grid is buried in the ground and so they have this very rational thought well i need to connect to the the grid the power grid and where is it in some places it's buried in the ground but it's uh, i can't get to it this um whereas you know there's people with different philosophies who would with probably with great sympathy say oh you feel like there's this distant thing you can't connect to or you're you're missing the like oh you know you don't have the right wire to connect to it and they would almost probably gently with a laugh say it's much easier than you think it's it you're already there you know so that, anyway th- those kind of ideas are floating in there yeah fascinating uh, this has a kind of new wave feel to it mm. i think and our uh, prep school gangsters a, a group you've encountered at all do they are they a real tribe many times yeah eternally in my life um <laughs> The Prep School Gangsters originally, it's best known to, to some people as a uh, kind of uh, iconic New York magazine cover from the 90s. It has a really beautiful uh, picture on, on the cover uh, of, of a bunch of these kids. And it, and it was about um, children of extreme privilege, Upper East Side kids, who, but living in New York where things are kind of jammed together, who were kind of stepping into a world of crime um, and, and, and interacting with people uh, from much less privileged backgrounds and, you know, hence the prep school gangsters, prep school kids who are wannabe gangsters. Um, this song is not about that too about them in particular, but it just got me kind of thinking about that kind of strange interaction and then you know, I I wrote down that phrase, you know, years ago, and just like, it sounds like something that should be a Vampire Weekend song one day. And then I thought, well, yeah, what's my way in? I don't want it to just be, like, silly. And I just kind of thought more about the, um, as much as uh, the, pra- the f- as much as the phrase prep school gangsters kind of can sometimes get a laugh or put a smile on somebody's face because it's, it seems so silly, then I realized the idea of a, 
of a prep school educated person of extreme privilege who still sees the world through a gangster lens, it's not that silly. That's half the people I've met in my life. You know, so I started to think that's actually a pretty interesting archetype when you take it out of prep school. What if you can you encounter a prep school gangster who's 60? I think I have, you know, and so I got interested in that and I got interested in this this concept of and also, you know, not not to judge these people too harshly. I, I also like this idea that there's some sort of conversation happening between the prep school gangster and maybe the non prep school gangster and the fact that, I mean, many people have made this point, you know, the, the kid on the Upper East Side, some of those kids, their grandfather may have been what we might call a gangster in some sense, whether they were literally, you know, running numbers or they, uh, you know, forcefully took over an industry or something. And this and the idea that the person who's now competing with them, looking at them as a child of privilege, one day that person might have a grandchild who is, you know, uh a prep school gangster. So, you know, whatever, for, for better, for worse, these things do happen in America. The, the American dream does happen. And the fortunes of families deviate widely. Um, um, so anyway, these are all thoughts that went into this song. Yeah, very interesting. Um, and is that, the, uh, right at the end of it, there's this big horn section or, mm-hmm. or, or brass band. You know, yeah. Wh- wh- where did that idea come from? That was just like, I, who knows why? We, you know, because like you said, this song is very, it's a guitar song. It's, in some ways, I think it's one of our most like indie type songs. Dung, 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 mm. dung, 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 dung. And um, I don't know, from the earliest demo, I just remember being with Ariana. I was like, oh, and then it should end with like, <laughs> like a big uh, kind of grandiose brass thing. Um, and that just always put a smile on my face. And maybe somehow that relates to the title i don't know it just felt it just always felt right and and even now you know i've been playing back the album for people and and i still like it so i'm like yeah that's that feels right it ends with this one note and i was kind of been joking with the guys ct plays a little trombone and Bayo was thinking about taking up trumpet and and i was like okay and then when we end the song live you guys grab the the horns run to the front of the stage and bum the end <laughs> <laughs> well that would be really exciting it'll yeah. be interesting to see how it happens i mean the last time around with father of the bride you know that was fan- fantastic because the live shows after that you know the, the band had grown you know and yes. suddenly it was maybe 10 people on stage or maybe yeah. even more and, Wait, and it was really exciting to see how you performed those songs that were part of that album yeah and, and there's still going to be a lot of people on stage and it's it just on the one hand, we you know we're very excited to try to faithfully reproduce the new album, but we're also so excited to go back. And we have a few new instruments on stage too, and um, you know these like really simple things. Just uh, we have so much fun doing, make us so happy. Like playing um, uh, playing the song from uh, Father of the Bride, Sunflower, with uh, harmonized uh, tenor sax and violin, just instantly. It's it's the same but different. And um, we feel very lucky that we have uh, some more uh, colors to play with now. Yeah, exciting. The Surfer is the next song on the new album by Vampire Weekend. Um, This has some kind of melancholy feel Mm. to it. It's quite haunting in places. What can you tell us about The Surfer? Well, The Surfer has a long history. It it was a a demo that I started with Rostam um, years ago, and it wasn't melancholy. It It was very kind of upbeat, different chord progression, different tempo. And there was something very cool about it, but I, I never felt like I quite understood what it was trying to say. And then um, years later, kind of was working on a, a different piece of music, and I started singing the the melody and, and, and words on top of it. And I started to feel like, oh, I, this tone suits it uh, more. Or I underst- at least I understood more what it was trying to say. And... Um, this is one we worked for a long time on. It's probably the most orchestral song. You know, Ariel really went hard. Uh, you know, he was like, we need a proper orchestra. And we did. We recorded uh, a, a large ensemble at uh, East West Studios, an old school studio in L.A. with like a big live room where, you know, they did Frank Sinatra records and things like that. Um, and we talked a lot. And, and also, you know, we wanted to have a grittiness. I always thought like the opening sounded like Cypress Hill. Or Wu Tang, you know, just stuff yeah. that you know people uh, for us growing up just the greatest. The, the music that 
on the one hand, you might say it doesn't have too much to do with Vampire Weekend, but it's some of the greatest recordings of of of, of our adolescence, you know. Um, and yes, we were trying to find that middle ground between um, something kind of big and grandiose, almost like David Axelrod, um, and still having a grit. And then, um, yeah, th- this this is how it turned out, and it feels uh, uh it always felt kind of proper that this would begin the back half of the album. It's not the way the vinyl split up just because there's technical specifications for vinyl, but this is track six and it's a 10 song album. So this is the beginning. And when I think about, you know, everything we've just listened to these songs that seem to have uh, conflict and anxiety in them. And I like that here there's a turn and you're talking about the, the character of the, the surfer and and especially with this kind of the the dark intensity of this song, the surfer no longer just feels like, you know, what a lot of people think of as a surfer, like a chilled out Southern California or Hawaiian person. It uh, it has something to do with, you know, a way of uh, looking at life. And, you know, there's so many uh, well-known metaphors about life and action as pertains to uh, water. Bruce Lee, be like water. You know, in in uh, the Taoist philosophy, nonstop references to water because water is something that can be intensely heavy and powerful, and yet there are uh, smooth and beautiful ways in which it moves, and which somebody in water can move with it. And anybody who's been to the beach knows, like, well, what do you do when a wave's coming at you? Do you just stand there? Sometimes you dive into it. Sometimes you flow with it. And what? what who is the uh, archetypal master of water? It's the surfer. Which is all stuff that I've been thinking about for like you know seven years. I, I just like think, what 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 is this? The surfer can't forget. Sometimes these th- these things come, and then I have to think about well, what does it actually mean to me. So I've had a, a bit of time. Yeah, <laughs> Gen X cops mm. is another uh, well another great title on another great Vampire Weekend <laughs> album. A bit like prep school gangsters, Gen X cops. Yeah. Some of these phrases, like you were saying earlier, Ezra, you know. They they pop out and and you think well maybe that could be a vampire weekend song or a yeah. lyric you know some that stick with you maybe and you put it in a folder mm. you put it away for further reference Gen X cops when did that arrive It was the same thing I you know it, it's named after a uh, late nineties Hong Kong action film um, and yeah again I wrote it down and then later yeah at some point kind of recognized oh prep school gangsters gen x cops that's like an interesting resonance the similar phrases the the way they're written out um that but this one also had, had goes way back it started b- before before there was the gen x cops angle it started as a simple kind of half finished demo that ct and i made and and there's a very special song to me because it's the first vampire weekend song that really came out of uh, me and ct sitting down and say let's write a song together and we worked on the chord progression together and the riff, which, you know, he started playing. You know, again, this is years ago. This is back in, uh, I remember it was in his apartment in um, Brooklyn, so whenever he lived in that apartment. And um, he had this uh, 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 lap steel guitar. So, he, you know, with the he was playing the uh, with a slide, which is how you get this kind of strange um, sound. It almost sounds like a synth, but it's so smooth. <laughs> I never play with a slide, so you know, it would, if I was playing that, would go ding 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 ding. Um, and we knew there was something cool about it, but it didn't quite like the B section, and you know, put put it away for forever. And um, and then I was revisiting it because we'd never done anything with that part of the song, and and I thought maybe I can write a, a new B section, and. And I did, and then we started working on it, and I showed it to Ariel, and then he got excited, and um, we tried a million different um, arrangements and drum parts and tempos, and then um, we finally landed here. And, um, yeah, I think it represents, you know, on this album, it, r- roughly, when we were working on it, I, t- I would sometimes just, in a in a very crude binary, be like, well, we got our punk songs, and we got our hip-hop songs. Obviously, like, The Surfer would be more hip hop in terms of the the groove and the tempo and this one would obviously be one of the punk ones so uh 
we tried to make sure it had that energy and, that, and even at the this was the one we were working up to the last minute just like adding little like guitar stabs and and new you know trying the drums one more time just to make sure that it, it had the that slightly frenetic quality yeah fascinating and uh, where does mary boone fit into the <laughs> that description so if you've got punk songs and um the the other songs mary boone is 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 in a different category entirely i would if it, you know if if i'm painting with broad strokes that one's still hip hop no, just still because hip-hop. because right, okay. uh, it 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 it's a big um uh our soul to soul back to life remix drums that we sampled it's the only sample on on this album and um you know it's just one of those you know and normally there's a there's a part of me that kind of felt like well maybe if we're going to sample something maybe it should be a bit more obscure i think that that they those drums have been sampled hundreds of times by people that's my understanding and yet it just felt so good when it came when it came in they were like all right yeah the, the rest of the song can is a bit orchestral and stuff but that part is just that classic feel good um hip hop groove of that era yeah wow amazing and yeah i mean there's these amazing choir backing vocals and, mm. and yeah and is mary boone a real person it, it's, yeah, Mary, Mary Boone is a real person. I mean, the, the song is not about her in any way too explicitly. She uh, she was a, a prominent New York art dealer. Um, I, I think she became well-known in the 80s, and um, there, she has an interesting story. Um, but if anything, there was, you know, the, the whoever's in in the song is, is, is addressing her, and I kind of pictured it more as the... Uh, um, the newcomer to the city and saying you know like it opens you weren't hiring but i was looking maybe this person is trying to be work in art maybe this person wants to be an artist but they're keep addressing mary boone i'm on the dark side of your room i kind of picture this like person who just like wants a piece of the action and they come and you know just like any big city you know that's how it works you got the the people uh it's a it's a destination for uh people who want to make it in some capacity and you know and some of them really do yeah that's really interesting and how do you marry those thoughts with the music you know so it, w- with this track you know when you were kind of thinking right let's sample that beat let's see mm. see what we can do with that I mean, is there any thought of of the lyric or anything like that at that point because it sounds like you're just kind of enjoying you know experimenting with those things and seeing if they'll work mm. or, or is the concept of of this person arriving in New York looking to be part of the action is that is that already there and you're articulating that musically it often comes really slowly and um and the truth is the, these kind of uh soul to soul sections th- there's no words and that, that's often been the case you get you get something and it feels good and you kind of there's always a moment where i think oh maybe this song would have real potential if then a big vocal comes in and takes it to the next level and i don't know if i'm lazy or unambitious or but it's kind of like I, don't know, I like how that sounds so the uh yeah it's it's interesting to have all have there's a lot of lyrics on the song and then have these instrumental moments where the music just speaks um so yeah they're they're definitely in everything comes little by little yeah, it's hard to say what what it's a bit of a chicken or the egg thing yeah yeah, and Pravda, as you articulate in the song, is the truth. Mm. Um, but what truth are you seeking here, Ezra? Well, I, I guess the first thing that <clears throat> I'm self-conscious about clarifying is that th- this, that these lyrics w- would have been written at least three or four years ago, so b- before the uh, Russia-Ukraine war. Um, that's a that's a bit uh, above my pay grade. You know, the idea of something. Like, oh, is this saying something? No, it's not the case. In fact. I, uh, yeah, whatever it was back then, I think I probably had more like the Cold War on on my mind. Um, and actually, it's around the same time I worked on a song for Liam Gallagher called uh, Moscow Rules. Um, so yeah, they're kind of two, <laughs> two, two Cold War songs. So yeah, the with, with little I know about, um, about it is that you know Pravda is the Russian word for truth, and it's also a famous newspaper. Mm. So there's this kind of funny irony because you know from the the Western perspective, they would often refer to uh, the newspaper Pravda as being full of lies. You know, of course, this was a, t- a time of great political tension, as it always is. And so you know, there's even people who use the uh, the phrase Pravda to mean propaganda. 
And of course, the, the, the Soviets could have said the same thing about the, the West, that, uh, you know, even if our newspaper is not called the truth, we, we, there's some sort of pride and assumption that uh, the, uh, the great papers of New York and London are giving you the truth, and they would say, well, it's just as much propaganda. So any, anyway, that, that kind of contradiction was always interesting to me. And, I, and also just I have a family connection to Russia, and I, I talk about it a, a little bit in the song. My um, my grandmother, who was born in Romania, and, and um, actually a lot of people in Van Pro, we can have some kind of tie to Eastern Europe, so I've always been a little fascinated by it. So, yeah, she was born in Romania, and, you know, one of these old school giant families, 10 siblings, and her older brother, he eventually became some type of bureau chief for uh, one of the uh, news agencies in Moscow in, in the 50s, and he covered the Stalin purge trial, and he was uh, he was really like the kind of star of the family. She'd always talk about her brother with pride because, you know, he was a guy from uh, working class roots who, you know, did some, uh, had a pretty high, uh, you know, prestigious, important job. So, yeah, I've always just been, yeah, been kind of curious about uh, that era and... You know, as much as there's this kind of like Soviet vibe to this, this song also is clearly like very New Yorky, and um, yeah, maybe I'm thinking about that that era of my family um, because there's some some combination of 20th century New York and Russia. Are these are the uh, stories and things I would hear that would kind of just haunt my understanding of uh, what my family was up to. And, and you know these these little th- you don't think about them all the time, but I think yeah, my we do have a, a balalaika hanging um, next to the piano in my parents' living room, and apparently it's my grandmother's cousin used to go play Russian folk songs at Coney Island. This might have been in the '30s or something. These little glimpses that you get from uh, family history that kind of, in a very incomplete way, give you some semblance of the past, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. So, I mean, you go from quite personal things, you know, with all that kind of family information to, to bigger concepts about, you know, Pravda and the truth and, and things like that. And yet it also seems like a breakup song in some ways, you know, because you're kind of saying, I'm not coming home to you. you know? Right, yeah, um, leaving at the rise, yeah, yeah. leaving at the, when I, because when I come home, it won't be home to you. Um, And, I, and I, you know, as much as, on this album, I really, I, I truly, I really tried to be, less of a smart Alec, just feeling older. I'm get, at this moment in my life a little less interested in just kind of uh, double entendres and plays on words for their own sake. I get just a little bit less interested in that now. Maybe I will be again. But with that one in particular, I also like that when I come home, it won't be home to you. Could either mean when I, when I come home, it's not going to be to you because we're breaking up, or the far more sinister, because when I come home, this place will no longer feel like home to you. <laughs> I will have so fundamentally changed some aspect of this place, this con- your consciousness, and and maybe that's the the Cold War element, the battle for the hearts and minds of even if it's if it's not a hot war where you're taking over territory, can you change the consciousness of a place to such an extent that your own home is no longer your home? Um, so yeah, I like that double meaning. Yeah. Yeah, and I love all the different layers that you've got within these songs. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. Hope is the last song, seven minutes, 59 seconds long. Mm. Is it the longest song that Vampire Weekend have ever released? I'm thinking it's pretty epic. It is. Yeah, yeah. I've, um, yeah, when, when we were starting to play the album for people, I would alternate between saying, and this is the longest song we've ever done, to see how they would respond, and then just saying, like, okay, and this is the final track, just to see... Because it would be nice sometimes when people say, how long was that? And say, about eight minutes. <laughs> really? It's like, all right, good. Yeah. It, it went, you got you you got in. Um, but yes, it's true. It's it's the it's the longest song we've ever done. And um, it, uh, yeah, it felt appropriate. And this is, you know, just like Ice Cream Piano always was felt obvious to me as track one. This always felt obvious to me as track 10. Um, I There was a lot of input from everybody else about tracks two through nine but I, th- that, this is what i felt confident about track one and ten and um yeah i think this one it there's different types of long songs you know there's there's the songs that have uh you know a, a 11 part suite where everything's different and this is ultimately d- despite the the kind of banging drums and the noisy guitars that come in this is a folk song 
so it's it's in the lineage of these uh old folk songs um where you know there's just a lot of verses and and I've I've always loved folk music and felt very connected to it and of course I love the the new school folk music of the 20th century with Bob Dylan and Neil Young and what they did with those forms um but this one it felt like it, it felt like it demanded a lot of verses and then the I wrote this bridge and we liked it so much we felt like I want to come back to this again noisier so all all these things added up to it being this like epic journey and um we we considered should we should we cut it down and you know you always talk to somebody who says that's a good song could be a single if you cut it down i just remember kind of thinking huh ah, i can't figure that one out that, 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 that's too tough um so yeah that's how it ended up being yeah the longest you've got enough singles on this album i, I, I hope so yeah i think so yeah it's, i mean it's it's fascinating and that looping piano is is that a loop or a... i knowing ariel he would he would have demanded that i played it more than once mm. i'm lazy I'll, I'll always i'll say loop it <laughs> and he'll say play it more than once and then also this is where i think you get into some of ariel's genius and where he he goes so deep into these songs you know and of course i i have something to say about it but sometimes it creeps up on me too where i realize Oh, every time, every time we return to that that figure, it's a little bit different, and that's that's pure Ariel. That's when that's when I leave, and I come back in a couple of days, and he's been sifting through everything we did, and I realize, oh, the first time it's a piano, the second time it's two piano, or yeah, mm. don't quote me on this. Then it's just an organ. That time it's just acoustic guitar, and you realize he really thought about it, and it's not just variety for variety's sake. It often there's some sort of narrative component and um uh that that's where his attention to detail and even the drums there's like a looped quality to the drums but then when you re- listen to them you're like wait that fill never happened before that that's pure Ariel. radio x